Good afternoon. Welcome to the Theotrade Afternoon Video. I am Blake Young. Today is August 15th, 2024, and today we're going to talk about good news is good news again, but it's not good enough. So we're looking right now at the NASDAQ, a huge recovery day, a very large bullish candle, and we're creating what arguably is a V-type reversal. Now, in a V-type reversal, something we should be aware of from a price pattern perspective is it has to break through the high. And generally speaking, we want the same number of days down as the same number of days up. And if it we're going to err on one side or the other, we'd really like to see the recovery faster than the drop down. And that's going to show you that we have enough momentum to reverse it out and go even quicker to the upside. And you can see that in something like this, where you had one, two, three days down, and it took one, two, three days up. But the third day up was enough to break free, and you duplicate that move. When you see that it takes longer to break free, takes three days down here and it takes six days to break three, even though it can still replicate the pattern, it still needs to break through the high. It just diminishes the power and the momentum that is going into that type of reversal. Now that's not the reason why we think that good news is not good enough. The good news that is driving the market higher today is off the expectation or the hope that the economy is doing well, that we're not really seeing this massive slowdown. And if we look at the retail sales that were reported today and the unemployment claims, you can see lots of green, actual beat forecasted, actual beat forecast, everything is great, hooray, Empire State Manufacturing, better than expected. Now, Philly Fed is certainly negative, but this is conflicting manufacturing data, so that's not good enough. Even the good news is still negative, so we're looking at this index on manufacturing, both Empire State, meaning New York, and Philly Fed, these two key manufacturing index, both are still negative. Both are still not showing growth. It's less negative for Empire State and more negative for Philly Fed. So manufacturing is not in a recovery. So first off, that good news out of New York is not good enough. We didn't turn around. We have not turned around. We're just less negative. We're less bad. As we look at retail sales, retail sales are up 1%. And that seems phenomenal. Hooray, we had 1% month over month. And that has been one of the big concern. Are consumers in a position where they are spending money? If consumers are spending money, then consumer discretionary spending is going up and retail sales should recover. And sure enough, we went to 1%. But look at the details in here and we can see that it was revised lower last time. So let's take a closer look. And we will skip the 2020 because that makes the the size and dimension to kind of get lost in the mix there. We want to see this. We want to see how retail sales have done. And you can see we were forecasted lower and it came out higher. Forecasted lower, it came out higher. Forecasted lower, it came out higher. And forecasted lower, it came out way higher. Well, forecasting doesn't mean anything. Forecasting is just a guess from economists. And economists are known for being theoretical in their behavior. I went to school in economics. Trust me, I spent years listening to these guys, and it is just a theoretical guess, a philosophical guess even. What we want to know is what was it and what was the revision? So what did the report come in at? What is the actual number and what was the revision afterward? And you can see that the revisions have actually been negative more than they've been positive. And when we revise lower, we've revised them lower to the tune of 0.2, 0.3% in many of these cases. In this last year, in 2024, Revise lower, revise lower, revise up, revise lower, revise lower, revise up, revise lower. So right now we're about 66% of the time we've revised these lower and we revise them lower significantly more than any of the revisions up. So the retail sales are confidence boosting, helpful to tell us that we think that we're doing better, but every one of these has been less stellar than what we would have thought. And the same thing is true about weekly unemployment claims. I want to remind you from last week, when we talk about weekly unemployment claims, these are new claimants. These are people that have not received unemployment benefits. They have probably lost their job recently and are now applying for unemployment benefits. Again, forecasts that and a, you know, 10 bucks can buy you a Starbucks coffee. Get rid of that forecast and focus on revisions. As we look at this, you can see these revisions, many of these revisions were lower, not a lot, but still lower. And the bigger aspect that I'm looking at in conjunction with this, or with specifically with weekly unemployment claims, is the trend that is here. You could do technical analysis on this trend. We could draw lines off the higher highs, higher lows, the lower lows, lower highs. We can look at this 
and see that the trend is rising of new claimants. This is a cumulative situation. The more claimants we have, if we were to draw kind of a center line in here, the more claimants we have, we're averaging probably close to about 230,000 new unemployment filings every week currently, and it's rising. It's going higher and higher and higher and higher. If we were to add all these up until you see weekly unemployment claims lower and new hirings go higher, what good is it to see that we're seeing 235,000 new weekly unemployment claims if we're only netting out 120,000 jobs? Because this is a lagging indicator. There's usually a waiting period in the states before you can apply for unemployment claims. So not only are we seeing more and more people filing for unemployment, but we also know the consumer is being stretched. Now today we had Walmart saying that they have not seen the impact to the consumer spending. Well, that's what we saw in retail sales. Retail sales would still seem to say that they are still spending money. But the difference is Walmart is a consumer staples primarily as indication of retail sales. They're not really showing you, most people aren't going to say, you know what, I want to buy something super high tech. I'm going to Walmart first. They're going to say Walmart is my source for groceries, the things I need. It is the toilet paper index and the cheaper product index. So when we substitute out higher cost stuff, we may end up at Walmart. Now, if we look at some of the other information, we would say, okay, if they are still spending, are they spending savings, pay their paychecks that aren't even reaching the bank, or are they spending on debt? Now, if we look at the report that just was released last week, this is from the St. Louis Fed, and this is consumer loans, credit cards, and other revolving plans. This is all commercial banks. This is in billions of US dollars. You can see that we are at, again, and holding at record highs. So this last week's report, you can see up and up and up and upward in billions of dollars, seasonally adjusted. So we are adjusting for seasonality here. This is the highest level we've been. We are leveraged to the hilt. Consumers are using their credit cards to pay for needs at this point. Not only are we up five times, more than five times, almost six times than where we were as consumers in total debt, we can see that, that from 20 or 2000. So in the last 20 years, we were almost six times higher. But if you zoom in and kind of focus on from this time period where the 2020 peak and we dropped and people talked about the fact that we weren't spending money during the lockdowns. So we pulled back. We ev evidently were paying off our debt. And then right here, we bottomed out in April of 2021, and we have constantly been buying and living off of debt, living off our credit card debt. We went from $735 billion all the way up here to over a trillion dollars of consumer debt. Now, that's the highest level we've ever been. We've crossed the trillion dollar mark that consumers are carrying on credit cards and other uh, type of revolving credit. That's also ties into the things that we've seen with buy now, pay later as well. If we look at sector rotation, we can see that the technology, that's this gray line down here, sold off to the worst of all the sectors and recovered to be in the top four. And the S&P has recovered to be in the top two. So really, it's being lifted over the last three months. The recovery in the S&P 500, the recovery in the, the NASDAQ is only surpassed by two things. That's real estate, XLRE. And you can see right here, this, if I can put my cursor on it, is healthcare. So healthcare, consumer staples, utility, real estate, we're still in a defensive, defensive mode. And being in a defensive mode, I want to look at where the big sell-off started and what we might expect to have happen. Now, this is the broad market, the S&P 500, this is the SPY. We gapped up on August 1st and began the big sell-off. Now we had a sell off earlier where we broke through support and that gap occurred here. So from the broad market, it appears that we're just returning to retest where all the sellers have been. Imagine instead of this gap, a ginormous red candle that is even bigger than this red candle. That is a lot of sellers. This is even more sellers and we're seeing significant sell pressure up here between 553 and we'll call this close price 
at 553.78. We'll just call it 554. So today we finished the day in that range where the sellers took control. That does not mean I want to instantly jump in and sell or short the S&P 500. But if it is what I see as happening, that the consumers are being stretched, the consumers are in debt up to their eyeballs, that we're seeing more unemployment, the good data is good for the economy, but not good if you're expecting rate cuts. And the people that are gaining from the rate cut hopes are going to be technology and the idea that consumer discretionary spending will be lessened in the impact. If we're highly in debt, those rate cuts would be helpful. But if we're not going to get the rate cuts because the good news is good news, then those that have rallied the most because of rate cut expectations are going to be subdued. We saw a decrease of that fourth rate cut by 38% today. And we're likely to see that continue if we keep seeing good news. If we don't see unemployment over 4.5%, if we continue to see expansion and inflationary pressures, then we should be not pricing in rate cuts and we should be pricing in a pullback again in those key areas such as technology, consumer discretionary, and in commodities. As we look at this, we're going to go over to XLY as my primary choice. And you'll see XLY is even giving more of a clear struggle. So huge day today, gap up, close higher. We gapped up from 176 and started the day about 180 and we finished up at 182.70. But that close price of 182.70, if we go back to the big bearish red candle, that close price was 182.89. We did not close past the gap. And so not only do we have a failure to close past the gap, a failure to reverse up here at these highs, but I'm looking at this and saying we failed here and we have even more sellers up here. So consumer discretionary is being weighed down and is not recovering anywhere close to what we just saw in the S&P 500. In fact, we're approximately half of the sell-off. Half of the sell-off can act as resistance. Half of any large buy or sell area has a tendency to act as a barrier and we're failing at that barrier. So I am watching for consumer discretionary to fail again tomorrow at this barrier because then it will likely come back to 177.50, if not continue lower. But I don't have to stick with consumer discretionary as a broad sector. You look at Tesla, you know, we filled the gap. It's a nice little bounce, but Tesla has certainly technology levels and some certain sentiment that's going to lift it more than others. But again, it's not even half of the pullback. We went from 271 down to 180. So we could take Tesla out of the equation, knowing that it's at 214, versus 182, we could get a sense of that with about a five to four ratio. And so this would be Tesla being removed the best I can out of the consumer discretionary. And you can see a nice recovery again, about half the sell-off, but overall still downtrending. Instead, I would say, take a look at some of the other big players in here and say, what is lifting the market today? What is lifting consumer discretion? You might say Amazon. Amazon's part of consumer discretionary. And we're in the middle of this big gap. And we probably will have to fight 185. So I'm not wanting to buy into Amazon, but I'd be looking for Amazon to roll over anywhere ahead of that 185. We already looked at Tesla, but what about some things like Nike? Nike is used to be a pretty good substitute of consumer discretionary minus Tesla. And you can see a lovely gap up close higher, but look at the space between on that earnings. Any rollover ahead of 94 is probably a good opportunity to short or take bearish strategies on Nike. We could take something more like Lulu, Lululemon, which is part of the consumer discretionary. All we did is trade up to the short-term resistance and nowhere near the recovery that we're seeing everywhere else. And so I don't see a lot of really exciting things in consumer discretionary that would have me looking for growth, except for things like Ross. And Ross stores, and TJ Maxx, Ross stores gapping up, closing higher ahead of earnings, clearing out more than 50%. Well, this is a substitute trade as well. This is when you say, I am not going to buy Lulu. I'm looking to be bearish Lulu. I'm not going to buy high expensive pants or yoga pants. I'm going to go dress for less. Ross stores benefit because we're going to be more careful with our spending. So Walmart hasn't seen it because they're being more careful with their spending. Ross stores is getting it because they're being more careful with their spending. We're not buying the high ticket items. We're buying the lower ticket items. Consumers are adapting and substituting lower cost items 
instead of buying higher cost items. So their spending is going on, but we're now spending it on cheaper things and not buying the luxury brands. And I would also expect that in things like bookings and Marriott and Royal Caribbean and Carnival to fail. And sure enough, we're failing at the gap again. So I'm watching for rollovers in pretty much everything in consumer discretionary that's not a substitute like Ross Stores and TJX. Everything else, though, that is a brand name that we go to as our primary interest, those are going to roll over and sell off. The ones that are the substitute and cheaper stuff, Walmart, TJX, Ross, they may maintain, but those are not the ones I'm trying to sell into. I did mention commodities. This is the Commodity Index DVC. It's very heavy weighted into energy. You can see that we've tried to V reverse here, failed, never broke higher. It still could create a funny looking head and shoulders, an inverse head and shoulders, but until it gets through 23, I see this as no demand in commodities and therefore this is a further injunction against the consumers that we're not buying, we're not demanding. And therefore all these stocks that are rallying that are dependent on consumers to get their earnings the consumer spending, especially discretionary, is one area that I would be looking for new bearish trades. Well, that's going to do it for me today. Join me again tomorrow on Theo Trade Live, where Brandon and I will be discussing the Buffett indicators. We're going to go into some detail on what the Buffett indicators have been telling us and, the, and Warren Buffett's behavior, or Berkshire's behavior, as they have gone into defense mode. So join us again tomorrow. Have a great day, and we'll see you again in the morning.